schedule there. I'm Robert of the Building Commission here at Lowell. Uh, I want to thank Cisco for uh, putting this together. He's spoken to us before, but we have all the people, and, and as you can see, we reached out to the communities, and, and uh, the presentation and, and uh, the information was useful. All of us here at Lowell use uh, the system that, uh, and the training that uh, Cisco gave us, and uh, we have new inspectors, so we want to have again. But I think this is a very good thing to reach out and meet everybody. So I'd like to have everybody just go around and introduce themselves so we all know who we all are. And, uh, and then Cisco can get started with the presentation. So as I said, I'm Robert of the Building Commission here at Lowell. We have our building inspectors. We have some, uh, some people from fire prevention here as well. Hi, I'm Mike Weber. I'm a housing inspector for Community Teamwork right down the street. My name's Cliff Lewis. I'm also with uh, Community Teamwork here in Lowell. Paul Orlando. Paul Orlando, I'm the building inspector for Rockport in Manchester. Dan Tway, building commissioner for Westboro. Louis Vasquez, CTI housing inspector. Dennis Barrow, fire prevention. Freddie Latham, fire prevention. Martin Fittado, Lowell inspector. Steve Narco, Lowell inspector. Christopher McWhite, Vans examiner. Sean Shanahan, Lowell building inspector. John Million, city of Albany building inspector. Paul Kelly, Framingham Code Enforcement. Randy Shedd, our Global Housing Authority. Dave yeah, Barrow, Fire Prevention Force. Paul Mackerel, Fire Prevention Lawrence. Greg Shana, City of Walton Building I think everybody knows, but uh, there's sign in sheets if you want to get CEUs and building officials. Yeah, two hours and then four hours if you're going to stay. So, with that, I'll introduce Cisco. I think most of you know him. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for. Thank you. So, uh, first of all, if everybody's got their coffee, um, you don't think anybody else is coming? Well, I, think this is I don't know. Time. Okay. Uh, one of the things that I'll start off with is, you know, so that everybody can get a chance to, you know, sugar up or coffee up, um, is I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, this fire escape over here that I'm going to be bringing. And every now and then, uh, just to give you a little guys a break, you know, as I'm speaking, feel free to take turns walking over, just walking around. Uh, but it's a great interesting piece because uh, we usually do what's called downtown walk-arounds, where we take you out on nice days like today. Not today. Without uh, <laughs> gloves or shoes. And we walked to the fire escapes. And uh, actually, some of the training we did last time, Bob walked around me in the alleyways. Remember, Bob? I do. And uh, we basically do what's called downtown walk around. Is you, once you get a class like this, we need to get you to look at these in your downtown so you can identify. But the way you're not going to identify this is not by getting on it and basically low testing it with a live body. You want to get underneath and look for telltale signs. So some of the things I'm going to be speaking about over there is what your what what are the problems that you have on these fire escapes? So uh, instead of having everybody right now just come around it, feel free as we're talking, you know, uh, two, three, just come along and just put, poke your nose onto what, he, what is here. So this is a, a piece that we actually replaced this entire fire escape out of an elementary school. This fire escape was in this condition and all we did it was four feet wide. All we did was slice it down the middle and then we put a piece of new flat in the middle and basically rejoined it the wrong way. So everything that you see on here is 75 years of neglect, 75 years of band-aids, and 75 years of what was a system that was basically was um, vendor-driven, we call it. Vendor-driven means that when this was built 75 years ago, um, did we need a permit to paint it five years later? 10 years later. How about 75 years later? If I want to paint this, do I need a permit from you? Oh, you know, uh, anybody, anybody issuing paint permits for fire escapes lately? No, no. Raise your hands. No, no. So what happens is the vendors of yesteryear basically were hiding in what's called the vendor, the, the, the paint permit. So the paint permit is that in case you come up on me, anytime I'm on a fire escape and I am welding something with, with or without a fire permit. I'm welding on this thing. With or without a fire permit. If I'm not pulling a permit, think I'm gonna, uh, you know, building permit. You think I'm gonna pull a fire permit? And if you, you know, you come up on us, what, what do we talk? What do we say to you? What are we doing? We're just painting, and we're changing a couple of bolts, all under maintenance. So this has been a vendor-driven industry because 75 years ago you were just maintaining, and these things were built to to last. And but when you look in here, you're gonna see some of the issues on this fire escape that now have some, some issues. One, you see this, all this orange? It's an indication of what? 
the orange, all this orange color on the, below the paint. Lead paint. Anything older than 78? Presumed to have lead. The EPA just declared that as of 2010. So can I put an open, open flame to anything that has lead? So can I weld on it? So welding is the, is the preferred method by a lot of guys. They'll show up, they will either leave the rust inside the connection, and then they'll just weld it. Can they do it if they have, if it's older than 78? In everybody's city, every fire escape is newer than 78 or older than 78. So 95% of all your fire escapes are older than 78. You get a few new ones, but not that many. So they all have lead. So when you start looking at what we did here, and this was buried in the ground, this was in a school where children used this every day to recess. This went up one floor to a door, and every day this came down and went to a recess. The person that made us change this out was the facilities manager there. So said, hey, you gotta come down and just change this out. It wasn't a building inspector, and it wasn't a fire prevention. So one of the things that we talk about with fire escapes which is very important, it's, we call it the bastard child of egress for a reason. And that is because it is one of those things that not many people want to see. So you'll inspect a building and you'll make sure that they have the right lights, the right exit signs, the right doors, the right this, the right that, but then as soon as you walk by a fire escape, for some reason either you're looking down or you're looking away. And that's what's been happening with these fire escapes that have been just getting paint jobs on them, not real inspections, and that's what we're going to talk about today is what is already out there that's going to make this process of inspection, which now will include a permit, which now will include EPA requirements regarding lead, which now will require drawings in case you're going to replace it with another one. So that's all. It already exists. We're just going to make you aware where it exists. But you're looking at a fire escape here that 75 years was basically kindergarten through eighth grade was exiting children. So now. Let's take a look at the fact that in, uh, I've got fire prevention and building department in here. 40 out of the 50 states, you know who watches this stuff? Fire prevention. You know in 10 out of the 50 states who watches this? Building departments, okay? Massachusetts happens to be, the building department is watching this out, but there's a, there's a few fire guys in here and basically there's a, rule of, there's a rule that they have. In case of fire, don't use the? Fire station. So that comes out of the fire. Right. The, uh, the older firemen tell the newer firemen coming in, if all hell breaks loose, you know, never use this thing. Can you imagine that? Firemen are being internally trained by other firemen to say, hey, go grab the ladder, even if it takes you three to five minutes. Call for one of the, one of the, one of the ladder trucks, even if it takes five to ten minutes. And everybody usually dies of, in the smoke part of it within how many minutes? So we don't have those three to five minutes. We don't have those five to ten minutes. And, but you, when you look at this fire escape, every wrong way to fix it has been done to it here. It was buried in the ground. Look at all, look at all, look at all the rock that it, that it did. It's got all historical band-aids here. And we've also put in some bolting to show that this fire escape, and 98% and of all the fire escapes built in the United States are built with bolts anyway. People have been welding them because it's easier, faster. So, we, but not, a lot of times not removing the rust. A lot of times basically band-aiding it because it's another five years. So these fire escapes are guaranteed not to pass every five years. As soon as you refurbish them, <coughs> then the fire escapes are guaranteed to pass structurally every five years. The only thing you have to keep worrying about is the paint because you can't guarantee the paint. When you paint over old rusty fire escapes, <coughs> in five years time, it's gonna be rusty again. Not necessarily full, but if you've changed the connections and you've, and you've siliconed the connections, you're not gonna have a structural problem on, on passing these. You're just gonna have a paint problem passing these. So that's all we're gonna talk about today and, and what is happening nationwide, what codes are out there. And a lot of the stuff that we're gonna show you uh, Lowell is a model city, so we have sample confidence tests, which is nothing but a final exam for a structural engineer to take. Not an opinion letter anymore, basically he has to basically check yes, no questions all the way down regarding this fire escape. And one of the key questions is, is, is are there, uh, of all the connections, are they all 100% free of internal rust? 
the connections into the building, which is usually a through bolt or a connection into the building. Have you verified those? If not, if you only spot repair these old fire escapes, you must conclude in a low test. If you don't, if you can't provide the city other, uh, other evidence of, uh, of, uh, of strength, then a low test is going to be the final. As soon as you start looking at low testing, which is not what we're going to be pushing today, we're not pushing low tests today. We're just going to say that that's your trump card in your pocket whenever you are not satisfied. Because the NFPA says it very clear, we'll cover it. The authority having jurisdiction shall accept by low test or other evidence of strength. We're going to show you what other evidence of strength is and what the term certification really means. Mass code says you must examine it, test it, or certify it. The word test means low test, certified means something. So we're going to explain what we believe certified means and what everybody in the country thinks certified means. And we'll go into detail. So if anybody wants to, uh, during one of our breaks, because again, there's two-hour class, so we'll go quickly to it for the two-hour class. Then the second half of the two-hour class is more in-depth, and, and that group will be, you know, really looking at this, looking at the drive. Uh, we have a website called Farscape Academy, and a lot of our uh, walk, walk, downtown walk-arounds are already up there for free. A lot of our classes that we've taught from here to California, we've taught from Seattle to San Diego, Chicago to Texas, and from Maine all the way down to you know, Washington, D.C., this very same class. And all these classes are online free. So a majority of our classes is the fire prevention, but uh, there is quite a few states and quite a few cities where building departments are, and in in Massachusetts, it's all building department. And I'm glad to see some good faces in here that are you know, fire prevention, because they're the ones that are going to use this. So we want to show just exactly how things got this bad, and that's what the class is all about. So as you can see on the, on the uh, picture there, it's the, uh, basically it's the fireman that basically uses fire escape all the time. We have, uh, Real life people. We'll show you what live load testing looks like. 
But we're not, this is not a low test class. This is to say that these two codes have that as a background if you can't satisfy the building commissioner. And then our building code, 1001.3, says testing and certification. All exterior fire escape systems shall be examined or tested and or certified. So they say examine it. They say test it. They say certify it. But what have we been doing for the past 50 years in this state? Examining it and calling it a low test and a certification. And right in the, the only one that really has a document that's been used that was Boston, it says clearly on the Boston certificate, uh, to the best of my information, knowledge, and belief, the fire escape is in, the, the, the fire escape is in conformity with the mass building code. That's all it says, you sign it. So is that a certification? Is that a low test or is that an opinion? And some of those, you can do those examinations which way? Physically on it, and sign that document, and collect 200, 500 bucks from, the, from, the, from the, the guy who's building just got a violation. Can you do it from your car? Can you do a drive-by inspection? So roll down your window, things still up in the air, fill out the thing. Because that disclaimer protects who? To the best of my information, knowledge, and belief. Is that a physical examination, or is that my disclaimer, my Escape clause. So those, that's what's been happening here in Mass, not just Mass, throughout the country. But we're basically going to explain what certification means and what other states are taking in as a certification. That's all. Otherwise, all three codes have the ability to low test, low test, low test. So you basically have support. In some cases, when a fire department is dealing with a client that there's a problem, they can have the building department kick in and, and basically push the low test. If sometimes you're having a problem in the building department, you can have the fire marshal walk in and help you with a low test question because he's not satisfied. The NFPA says it the clearest and that uh, the authority having jurisdiction shall accept by low test or other evidence of strength. So we'll talk about today about other evidence of strength. And we have a piece here that we can show uh, in detail what we consider other evidence of strength. Well, right now, right, right, we're taking out Bridgeport, the Connecticut, out the hoses. last year. But earlier in the night when they pulled out, there were planes <laughs> coming out of the side of the building. Firefighters say it was one of the scarier moments because when you pull up to a building and you see children and mothers hey, on the other side of the fire escape, smoke swirling around them, they said that's scary, scary stuff. They got up there, got the ladders up, and they said nobody got hurt. The uh, fire escape, there was uh, three or four people hanging off the fire escape. They couldn't get off. They were oh, just on the fire escape. And people hanging in the fire escapes at the rear of the building. And on this side of the building, they, we had a bunch of people on that fire escape. Well, about 50 people were displaced inside this building. Up our fire department said there's good news tonight. It looks like everybody will be allowed to go back in except the one unit where the fire was in. They said, that's good luck to them tonight. <coughs> I'm Bob Wilson. I'll see you later. Tonight. It was eight. My question is, what do they mean people got stuck on a fire escape? In the front, in the rear, on the side. What do I mean they got stuck? They can't, they can't jump. Or height will break a few, a few limbs. The ladders didn't operate because it's all ladders. What happened? And here's the saddest part. Every fireman that showed up there, was he fighting a fire or was this a rescue mission as soon as they arrived? With people on the fire escape. Rescue. Fire fight or is it a rescue mission first? Rescue. rescue. What happens to that building as, you, as you're rescuing people off a fire escape, which is supposed to be a self-evacuation system? Right. You're using yourself. You're not supposed to be using, you know, firemen are not supposed to use it. They're yours, it's a self-evacuation system. And if the ladders don't work and people are trapped on them, how many, how many people can you get down a ladder? Those precious minutes are just burning up that building. We inspected this complex six months later in the same condition. And you know, we, we brought the information to the to the fire prevention there, but fire escapes is not something anybody wants to talk about because if they talk about this one, what about the other 12? complex is right next to it. What happens then? Cisco, this is probably a good time just to interrupt you. So what? one of the things we've done with Cisco's help here is we, we, we include the fire escape inspection as part of the, the 110 periodic inspections. And the uh, fire prevention, when they're out about it, they see fire escapes, they let us know, they let the building owner know that they're responsible to maintain it. And when we find them, we have this, I'll put this over there, something that we drafted basically just cites the two sections that require that it be maintained and then testing and certification we give to the building owners. Uh, we haven't reached the second phase, which is where we 
flagged in the actual inspected fire escapes because we know this is going to be a big deal to get compliance. Three to five years. We're doing it over time, plus we've got a lot of turnover. But the goal is working with fire prevention and, and the engine companies is to identify them, inspect them, and flag them and get the owners to comply because we have a lot of 75 year old plus fire escapes in the city on apartment buildings. That's the scariest thing I can think of. But, uh, that's the way we're handling it now. So I'll put this over there at the table if anybody wants to grab a copy. And I believe they also sent that out with a tax bill, isn't that correct? The first they time? They did, yes. So we're going to have to do it again, another round. Created a letter, sent out with a tax bill, and just basically made an awareness. What this is is really a, a program of, of identifying the fire escapes, not necessarily fixing them right now, identifying them, and then asking those people to basically put a placard on them that says, and we'll talk about placards, put a white one on it that says it's certified, put a yellow one on it that says it needs repair. Put a red one on it saying, don't get on it, people are gonna, people are gonna get hurt. Now, if they're gonna fix it within 30 days or three years, that's, that's a second phase of this. But just identifying the fire escape and identifying that in just loose terms that it needs a paint job, there is no dangling treads, there, the city will never put a white tag on it. That's, that's for a uh, structural engineer or others approved to the city official. But as far as just identifying, and you may, be, you may want to go out and find that, you know, like Boston did it uh, in the 70s, they found 8,500 fire escapes. So if you have 1,200 fire escapes, go find them. Then start the process of tagging them, meaning asking the people to put a tag on them. And uh, the tag, the white comes from a professional uh, certification, but the yellows and the reds can be, like you mentioned, through your normal inspection process. We're going to talk about tricks, which is tagging and putting it on lists, like you said. Uh, if you, uh, the city of Boston, which I'll talk about now, uh, after the Channel 7 news piece basically made it so that in case you pull a permit for anything on your building, to close the permit, you need a, you need a, fire escape, a current fire escape certificate. So there's little tricks. Yes? What, in your opinion, makes a fire prevention official, building inspector, commissioner, or all points in between qualified to determine that a fire escape is safe for use? You're not doing that. I know what you're saying. There's, no, you're not going there to say the fire escape is safe for use. You're going there and you've identified a fire escape on the building, and you only can put uh, the fact that it doesn't, it has not, doesn't have a paint job, the fact that no, no dangling treads. The only thing you can put on there, if you wish to put on there, is a yellow or a red a fire escape. If you see dangling treads, you're just identifying it as something with a hazard. If you see that it just needs a paint job, but you're not inspecting, you just say, I need you to get this professionally inspected. And you send out that letter that says in 30 days, please provide us with an examination of this. So this is not an examination by the city at all. This is just identifying one. And if they see a hazard, the ones that we need to know is fire prevention. That all of a sudden, they were at a building doing a smoke detector inspection or doing a uh, sheetrock inspection, and they realized that the fire escape on the back. For example, Seattle, uh, because of the training that we gave them, made every fire escape in Seattle must have a tag on it for the benefit of the fire department. So when the fire department comes running in the middle of the night, they look up, they see a white, all right, they see a red, don't get it, don't get on it, they see a yellow, they choose if they want to get on it or not. And a lot of times yellows and reds, they don't get on it. until there's white tags on these fire escapes. The firemen have justification not to get on it, pull the ladder, do whatever they do. But the people who put the white tags on it is not the city, it's always a, a structural engineer or others acceptable to them. My, my, my question is probably more fundamental. We get a report from a qualified engineer or uh, of some type who says this is kosher. How do we know it's, it is kosher? How do we know that they're not getting some bogus paperwork because they got a nice paycheck? Well, I'm, I'm here to tell you that sad to say, <laughs> you know, six out of ten times, seven out of ten times, it is it is just a fly-by, drive-by. But we got, we got new documentation that's in that book that we prepared for them. It's called the confidence test. And that confidence test now is an actual questionnaire that says the treads, yes or no, have rust in them. The, the rails, the grating, the support, the through bolt connection into the building, you know, so it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a final exam. Well, part yes. of the answer, too, is this training is to give all of you guys that basic information you need. It's not hard because it's obvious. To Right. Show you. So and this yeah. confidence test, you can actually go online to Seattle.gov and download uh, out of Seattle.gov, out of Tacoma.gov, out of LA. They have, they basically started coming in. We can't have opinion letters coming back from the engineers because there was no money to be made. One of the reasons why a lot of engineers hadn't stepped into this is for 75 years, who was ruling it? Vendors were ruling it. Vendors were painters, basically. And if there was any band-aids, they call their friend Charlie. 
Charlie would come down and weld this tread or change that bolt or do whatever, and the guy would basically take a job that was 15000 and do it for 1500 After a while, these painter guys started getting competition from landscapers, from handymen, from you know the local florist who wants to make a buck out of the, out of the landlord in the building, because as long as you need to pull a permit, uh, you don't need workers' comp, you don't need liability, you don't need any of that stuff. So all of a sudden, this is for, for 75 years that's been hiding under this maintenance umbrella, and, and every time they change the bolt, like you said, if you change the bolt, don't you need to pull a permit? So they kept hiding, it, and then whenever they got caught, they would basically hide. And if you look in all your history of all the jackets, you're, you're going to be hard pressed to find any repair permit being pulled for a fire escape repair. Magically, a certificate just shows up. And that's what we're going to come to today. So, station uh, night fire, she wanted to do a class, I mean, a one minute piece. I brought it down to, um, the, to the uh, theater district uh, by the way. I gave her a 15 minute training uh, about what to look for dangling treads, expansion in the connections, things you can visually see from a sidewalk. And um, she went out and did this. So these are, these are what we call live low tests. This is what sometimes you'll do when you walk on a fire escape, thinking, let me go check out what this is. You'll, you'll never walk on a fire escape again. From the ground, you'll be able to look up and see certain evidence. And what's called all you know evidence of repair, which is if you see nothing but square heads and rivets when you look up, has that thing ever been maintained? If you look up and you see all new bolting that is hex heads, has that some attempt at maintenance been? So, you're going to be, as you walk around now in your city, and you keep looking up, and you keep seeing rivets and square heads. What you're going to be able to see from here is what, if you were actually able to look down, just how much rust is in every connection. The average rust, because of some of our cases that we did, takes 25 years to grow a quarter inch of rust unchecked. This is a case we're doing in Iowa, where some students were up here watching fireworks. Two guys and a girl, basically the, that fire escape fell on the roof, fell to the ground. What happened here is the maintenance guys were fixing that fire escape to do the, the siding. They took the fire escape off that was through bolted, and then they latch screwed it back into the building through the holes that were the through bolts. So this is us when we found the smoky gun. They basically took all the pieces of the fire escape and put it like six blocks away, and they looked like the That's how they they you know, protected the evidence, you know. But we got lucky, we, as we were pulling up all the pieces, what did we find hanging out of one of the brackets? That bolt, we photographed it. Then they put it right back. And when they put it back, now they were so scared of not doing it correctly that not only did they through bolt it, but they also put a leg. But the photographs that we have, the leg, which is a tube, four by four, is right into the shingles, you know, right into the roof shingles. There's no footing there, there's nothing. And this piece over here, which didn't have legs before, so that was what's causing all the torquing, in the corner, there was a hole for a bolt that they didn't put in. So we were able to videotape ourselves going there. We actually grabbed that and walked it one to two feet in one direction and then brought it back and just dropped it back in. So a lot of times without engineer oversight, basically what you have is a vendor-driven situation where they do what they think is best. So when you have a florist and a landscaper basically you know, doing this kind of activity, you're going to get this. Because their main, their main job is hiding it, hiding it with paint, hiding it with caulk, and getting a check from the client. This is the, some more live boat testing. How many times do you have parades? Firemen, this is what, a lot of times for some reason a fireman can't get through the front door and they have to get somebody evacuated out, the, out through a window. So firemen are constantly putting themselves at risk. Back in the day when there was no AC, we didn't think everybody slept. And, and by the way, uh, one of our guys out of Chicago, uh, this is not a picture of his dad, but his dad was doing this work and he fell seven stories. Basically, cut the wrong clip, and it fell seven stories. So, who does this affect? Anybody who touches it. Building inspectors, fire inspectors, tenants. We're trying to pass a new law under this, you know, the National Fire Escape Reform. We're trying to pass a law that all rent now should be collected through the fire escape by the landlords and the management companies. So that every tenant now just basically puts their envelope on the outside of the window and then calls in and says, hey, your check is here, come and get it. <laughs> And it's all, you know, they can only access it through the fire escape. I think we're going to get a, a change in the, so, and, and so this, this is some of the things that we're dealing with when it comes to live load testing. And, and people have done all kinds of crazy things now. Weddings are now taking place on fire escapes. Uh, students.
Can't smoke in the building. Where do you smoke? Can't keep candles. Can't keep pots uh, and plants. Where do you keep them? Where do you grow your tomatoes? Where do you keep your bicycles and your, and your cans, the five cent cans? So who inspects fire escapes? Nationwide, the, the codes are very clear. Structural engineers, and sometimes a registered engineer. So our code is not, doesn't specifically say structural engineer. It says a registered professional. So they're really relying on you. Do you accept you know, a civil engineer or a landscape engineer or somebody that's registered? Do you accept them? In, uh, in some states, a registered professional also means architects. Who chooses that? You do. You're going to choose. The code says uh, registered professionals are others acceptable to the building officials. So you may want to choose other people. Some people think you guys are inspecting these fire escapes. You, you were just there last week and you didn't say anything wrong about my fire escape. Why are you picking on this? Because like, my, my building inspector was just here, man. He didn't, he didn't pick on any of this. Why are you giving me a hard time? There's fire escape inspectors. The only ones that are inspected, there's actually two licenses available in the country. One is out in Boston. Boston gives you a G3 license. And a G3 license is a, a license to, uh, to put up window guards and railings and fix fire escapes. And do, else, do, do what else? You can also now inspect fire escapes or examine them in the city of Boston and some other cities in and around that allow you to. And you can also sign off on them. So in the city of Boston, a lot of these fire escapes, the 8,500 fire escapes are being signed by who? <coughs> Structural engineers or vendors? Vendors who are working with a repair permit or a paint permit? Paint permit. So that paint permit that I can sign off on my own work, any, any room for abuse? All right, so the G3 has also gone out into the, the surrounding area, you know, to the, in some cities. So permits are being pulled a lot of times with the G3 license. Certificates are being signed by G3. And because it's vendor driven, was there some abuse? You bet there was. There's a evidence of it. Why? Because it was easy. If I can just paint it and collect the check, and think I'm not working and collect the check, or I'm just going to paint it and collect the check. What school uh, system was this from? Let's see. I'll uh, I'll point it down to uh, within Cambridge. Well, I mean, it's on the Cambridge, uh, you know, Somerville, Arlington line kind of thing. But it was an elementary school, private elementary yeah, school. Did Washington school. We have a bunch of old schools in the city. Well, you guys do, and we have fire escapes, so part of what we do when we do our annual inspection, and they're doing it slowly, but there's all kinds of pressure because the city is funding these things. They're not pushing, but just as you said here, we got kids. In some cases, they're just secondary, they're not used daily, but they're there, so if, you know, sooner or later, some can use them. We don't have any this bad, but there are some that we have to do some repairs, but I'm concerned about the schools that have them. The, uh couple of schools issues. One is uh, the law is very clear. During a fire drill, which is twice a month, one announced, one unannounced, you're supposed to use the closest exit. So you're actually supposed to be putting these kids through these fire escapes for them to get used to height the issues. Nobody ever does. They'll run them 100 feet in the other direction, and a lot of times because they don't trust these fire escapes. And charter schools. Charter schools are occupying buildings that were never schools. And so sometimes the fire escape on the charter school, old office building, they have crossover balconies and ladders. So whenever charter schools, they're supposed to, uh, there was a change in use, they were supposed to change the fire escapes to meet the egress as if it was a school. So be aware that some of your charter schools need to upgrade their fire escape systems because they're not the code. And very few charter schools go into old schools. They go into basically, you know, building complex somewhere and that's where they basically take over, okay? When you say not to code, to what code? Well, when you do a change of use, again, the building inspectors will tell me, sometimes they'll make you bring it to current code, for two trails, you know, 711 rise and run, or you gotta bring it to the code that was at the time, meaning, you know, the, the fire escape, you know, you're not, you're not forced to change the, uh, a fire escape that has a ladder to, uh, to a staircase because it's an existing commercial building. But as soon as I put a school in there, now I have to take that ladder out and I have to complete a stay to the ground. Because a lot of times these, uh, these exterior egress systems, you know, they don't have uh, the, the rise doesn't have the solid. Right. And, and how you get to the ground. Every inspection is going to be discussed back with you with photographs. 
He has to basically close up some lines in some of these parallel uh, rail systems that they have and basically at least reduce the liability associated with that. But that's what an engineer inspecting it with photographs back to you because everything's supposed to come back to you during the examination. The code is very clear. Examine, test, certify, right? This is a fire escape and just from where you're sitting right now, pass or fail. I got a call from a secretary. This is down in Fort Lee. This building is actually where the um, uh, the East Coast Hollywood in Fort Lee was. Believe it or not, was the East Coast Hollywood for the silent movie. All the silent movies were done in this place, which is now a big warehouse storage place. But she called me because she got a letter from an engineer that said in reading this letter, it basically says. Fix one tread on the fire escape, unbend one piece of slide on the on the on the on the platform, and give it a paint job and I'll sign it. But he has a disclaimer down here. That when you read the disclaimer, it says this was this was not a low test. This was you know this is my opinion. Yeah, we came in and we condemned the whole fire escape system. And these are all red markings of all the violations. Now this is a secretary. Now Fort Lee and uh, in New Jersey in the tri-state area, we actually teach through Kane University. We teach a six-hour continuing ed course, mainly to fire prevention. So we have taught at Sayreville, Camden, Bergen County. And this is, we teach this class just to fire prevention. It's six hours, and, and now Fort Lee is, they attended one of the classes, so now Fort Lee, like Lowell, is a model city down there that says, no, we have to do something about it. And they're taking the three to five year program, which is, you know, to not upset the apple cart. They're identifying the fire escapes, and on, on a one, two, three fire escape rhythm, just starting to get to know just how to handle this, because you're gonna get a lot of blowback tons of blowback and you sort of you sort of have to have a plan that is identified first secure it second and then fix it third in a yeah, proper we way. We won't accept the NAF David from an engineer we've had several attempt it that has that qualification where they claim they have no knowledge of the existing mounting system yeah, yeah. well then the letter is useless because that's critical. Right they, then and then your confidence test that you have that's one of the lines that's one of the questions number 19 it says how did you verify the, the connection did you open up the wall did you take a little hole uh, back here and basically open up a little one-inch hole and throw in a snake and photograph it? I mean, there, there's ways to do it. You're just choosing not to do it. So don't say you can't do it. You can. And it's done every five years. So you can either just open up some holes on the outside. You can tell you, and we'll show you examples of us doing the verification process. This is another one. I was in Chicago and uh, looking at a building over there, and they already had a structural engineer stand, uh, a letter on it. They said, fix a few little things. I went there. And this is unique in that on each corner, there's a, a bar that goes back to the building with a through bolt on the top. So instead of having legs underneath it or diagonals underneath it, it has a bus. So it's suspended. And at the corners here, it's basically a rod that comes down and it was threaded and then a big nut, you know, holding the, the ends. And then and the engineer said everything was fine, just give it a paint job, fix a few things. And we basically uh, sent these photographs back to the ownership and says, uh, Sure you want to fix some of these things? So this is again, engineer opinion versus a confidence test. An opinion is who do they send out that day? Do they have their coffee or not? What are they really looking for? A confidence test, which is in your book, and we're going to cover the book in a second, a confidence test asks them specific questions. So the liability starts to rest on them when they answer yes, no questions. This is out by Worcester. This is the detention center on Route 9. Kids 17 and younger. So, and this is into a courtyard, a closed courtyard for them to either recess or whatever. When you first get to it, you know, the fire escape is not bad. When you get underneath it, so this fire escape is going to either hurt the kids, hurt the, the people watching the kids, hurt the firemen trying to get in the building to save the kids. It takes 25 years to grow a quarter inch. This half inch. This is, all, this is another school down in Jersey by the shore. So, Ross, it's guaranteed. You give it air, you give it water, you give it time. What are you going to get? If you don't properly maintain it, when you maintain a fire escape, when you maintain a piece of steel, all you're doing is stopping or reducing the amount of time it's going to take to wither away to nothing. <laughs> You'll never keep a piece of steel forever. You're just going to reduce how long it takes. So you keep it painted, you're going to make it last 100 years. 
If you don't keep it painted, it'll last 25 to 50 years. That's all. But it's going to wither away. Eventually, you're going to have to change that piece of steel outside because it, it just can't handle it. So the main thing that you guys are going to be concerned about firemen or building inspectors is the fact that there's an unknown. When you start walking up these things, this is what occurs. And you have this kind of rust. This is an inspection and a hammer test. So as we walk up this thing, we have a simple three pound hammer. And that's just so we know whether or not we can continue the inspection or not. But imagine you're going up, take a peek at this fire escape, or a worker is going up to, to do something, or you're coming down. Going up is one thing, you're gonna get hurt. Going down, you're gonna break one of your limbs in the wrong direction, and then you're out forever. Because knees will bend backwards, knees will not bend forwards. So if your leg gets trapped and your body motion is still going, so uh, some firemen know that some of the biggest accidents or some of the, uh, a lot of the uh, injuries, the simple injuries that happen to firemen, isn't it fire escape uh, treads giving way or trip, trip hazards that happen on fire escape? Now we did a case where a fireman fell through this fire escape and we'll, and we'll, we'll go through it, but let's just be clear, we're not making it, we don't need any new code, it already exists. We're trying to tell you that the authority having jurisdiction shall accept by low test or other evidence of strength. So we're trying to tell you that the fire department and the building department and the housing code has in their back pocket the word low test. And that, uh, that a, an engineer is going to go out of his way to provide you other evidence of strength, which is a refurbishment of a fire escape. A fire escape that is built within its first 25 years, you think you need to change the bolts? Within the first 25 years of a brand new fire escape? I don't know if it's going to be maintained. It's probably maintained. How about between 25 and 50 years, do you think there, that there's, there's a bolt change coming? Because in that building, in 50 years, have they changed the windows? Have they changed the roof? Have they changed the boiler? Have they changed the bathrooms? Have they changed the fire escape? No. No. So the average lifespan of a bolt is 25 to 50 years. So swap out the bolts, keep the steel. Because the beauty about steel is that the, the middle of steel never rots. The, wherever it joins and pools and collects bird poo and, and, and leaves and stuff, that's where it rots. So if you change all the connections, and did they have silicone 50 years ago? So if today you change all those things out and you inject 50 years silicone in those joints, tar, and it's going to stop have water from getting back there, you basically have a fire escape that for the rest of that lifetime of the building should be just a paint job problem. And then if all of a sudden a fire escape is properly repaired, all the joints clean, sealed, rebolted, can the owner just keep it painted for the rest of his lifetime? Does he need a permit? what? To paint it in the future. So he goes, we basically just reset the dial on the thing. So after it gets fully refurbished and properly certified by a structural engineer, now the owner can just keep it painted. So he can paint it, his brother can paint it, he can call a landscaper, anybody to come and paint it. Why? Because you basically seal all the joint. This is connection management. That's all you do. What you can see on the outside and then connection management of what's buried in the building. Can you find those? Yes, we can. We'll show you how. So, yes. The International Building Code. What section is that? Are you looking for? The International Building Code? This is a quick uh, snippet of your 1001.3. 1001.3, it's in your code, if I may use this book for a second. And well, let's, 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 let's use this time now just to explain what's in your book. And it'll be referenced throughout. I'll tell you how this happened. Right here, what you have is what we call a repairs and procedures and guidelines. At the very bottom, you have the building code. The mass building code says, all exterior bridges. Any fire escape yet? So what is a bridge? What's an exterior bridge? Is that a porch? Is that a catwalk? Is that a handicap ramp? Right? All exterior. So all exterior. Um, steel or wooden stairways. What's that? That's everything. That's decks. Front stairways, back stairways, porch, porches on the back, a deck with a stair off the back, all exterior still wooden stair, and like you said, cement, which is not listed here, but it's a common sense that the cement must be maintained in good order. We mentioned fire escapes yet? Let's go there next. Fire escapes and egress balconies. What's an egress balcony? Porch. 
It's a porch. There's an egress balcony, also one of those Romeo and Juliet de decorative balconies that hang on certain buildings. And people can use that as an area of refuge, waiting for a fire to get down. Okay, so we don't have to inspect uh, exterior, um, exterior, um, we call them Romeo and Juliet balconies. They really don't serve any purpose, up, but they basically, if somebody's going to wait there, if their if uh, you know, apartment's on fire, whether they wait with this fresh air, and who gets them down? So shouldn't that platform on some of these complexes that have all these cement pads and no way to get out, that, who gets those people up, up to seven stories, right? Seven stories? That's the average height now, right, for the fire trucks? There's no yeah. way out. It's not a means of egress. I'm not calling it a means of egress. I'm just calling it what it says here. It's an egress balcony. An egress balcony is a place where people can get egress from. They sometimes call it uh, area, of area of refuge. It's a place you got to wait while <laughs> you're screaming and yelling, help me, help me, and ladder show up, truck show up. Um, shall be examined, or tested, and certified for structural adequacy and safety every five years by a mass registered professional engineer or others qualified and acceptable to the building official who shall then submit an affidavit to the building official. The affidavit has been in the past a letter on their letterhead. The affidavit in the past, if you were using it in Boston, has been a document that they created that some other cities copied, and it basically says to the best of my information knowledge, will be able to talk to you to the mass building code. That's all it says. So, what are we going to talk about today? We're also going to talk about lead. EPA 2010 says you can't burn anything that has lead older than 78, you need your renovator's license. Just so you know, any contract that can go for eight hours on a weekend and get that class. He, as long as he attends it in the morning, by the end of the day, he gets this piece of paper. He then gets the privilege of, of giving $300 to the EPA and registering their firm with the EPA. But they have this little license that says, I know how to wear the little white suit, the little plastic gloves, and the little mask, and I can you know, put the plastic down and collect all these chips from the building or from the fire escape. So that's a renovator's license. By the way, you guys know these guys. This is OSHA. You know what OSHA says about EPA? They totally disagree with us. What are you talking about? You're not protecting the workers. Whether it has no lead or low lead, you know, we're going to start finding these guys that we show out there because where's their blood? Blood draws. Where's their 30 years of, uh, of medical records? And they're exposed not only to lead, they got asbestos. We got all kinds of problems. And the, one of the biggest problems out there for OSHA is the iron workers feel. And, but yeah, but this is the ornamental guys, you know. They're worse. <laughs> they don't follow half the rule. They go up and fix these fire escapes off the ladders, no, no harnesses, no nothing. So OSHA just stepped in. We were on a nice 10 story building in Pittsburgh, and guess who showed up? Because they had nothing to do that day. I guess they're not building any other buildings that day, and we're repairing a fire escape. So a lot of times you need to have your OSHA 10 certification. And when you, when you take that OSHA 10, my God, there's things in there you're like, I have to do that, I have to do that. I have to do that. So here we are complicating because this is a lot of this fire escape work is done by mom and pops. Mom and pops who don't have the EPA license and don't have their OSHA. Okay? We'll talk about that. Confidence tests. You have examples, these are this is examples of the confidence tests done by here by Lowell. All this is is a confidence test that we pulled that we generated for um, Seattle. Seattle called me out to do a class just like this. Was it before three guys fell off the building or after three guys fell off the building? So when we got there, we basically came in and explained what's been happening nationwide and that the eyeball testing is, was a critical, so we created this exam. So we generated this, this exam and basically, if you go to seattle.gov, you can actually download. You go to fire prevention and down there in their, you, you know, in their website, you can get a sprinkler a test, you can get a alarm test, there's all kinds of testing uh, examples. And basically, you can just get it as a PDF or a Word document and change the word around with your name on it. That's all. So this is an industry standard now that some, uh, you know, some states, and we've had a, a lot of great results, we live in the tri-state area, also at all places, Washington and, and uh, Port, um, Oregon, Portland. We actually had success last year, and in 2012, they actually adopted our system and changed the, the Oregon building code to reflect these standards. So one state down in, one in Antigo, but they're on the other side of, on the other side. But um, before I go any further, let's talk about what this is. I was actually in a class, um, I lived in Westboro, and there was another class that we did out further out by Springfield, and we have, a lot of these classes have a state fire marshal. So we had Gene Novak at yours, we also had there was another gentleman out, and basically we were talking about what can we do to basically help 
um, you know, in getting some of this uh, information out there. And he basically told us, he goes, listen, if all fire departments and building departments have what's called repair procedures and guidelines for everything, for, you know, solar, for, uh, you know, septics, for everything, and they basically use on their letterhead, the little write-up, like what we would like you to see here and do, and it just makes it easier for the permit process, and they explain in, in general terms what to do. And so, and speak with that state official, uh, state inspector, he goes, if you design a, a generic explanation of what to do without mentioning anyone, without mentioning exactly how to do it, you just, you just make it a generic statement, you then can create an inspection regime for an inspector, you can, you can have an inspection regime for the repair guys, and you can have an inspection regime for the painters. You put the guy's name at the top, such as the building official. We send this, we send this to Bob and say, hey, you can either use this or steal things from here and put it on your own letterhead if you don't want. But otherwise, we can send it to you in PDF or send it to you in Word, and you just put your, your name here, or Kate will actually do this for your city and put your information on top. And all this is is just a generic thing that says, hey, you're an engineer. The city wants you to examine it and give them a copy of the report and talk to them about it. That's all it says there. Do not just do the report, you know, for example, in Seattle, you have to have a preliminary report. You don't have an ending report. That's all you guys are getting here. A structural engineer is called by the beginning of this job or at the end of this job? The end. To do a drive-by, to look up at a black fire escape that's still tacky and wet. You think he wants to walk on that thing? And he's going to give you that disclaimer certificate anyway, right? But in Seattle, you have to have a preliminary uh, confidence test. So you actually fill this confidence test twice, and you provide it back to the official. The confidence test says, hey, I found it. It's bad. It's got problems. And you're supposed to have photographs. So that's what this thing says. This says, oh, if you're going to do repairs, there must be an engineer oversight. So if anybody's going to repair it, the city wants to know who's the engineer oversight that's going to take control of the project and see it two or three times during the, during the repairs. And then there's a painting part of this that says, if you're going to paint it, are you aware of the EPA guidelines? So if, when you read these three, and we provided this, and this is something that you can have on your desk, on your countertop, you can have it on your website, and whenever somebody asks you the common question, what do I do? Well, there's three people that are going to be involved with you. There's going to be an inspector involved with you, a repair guy involved with you, and a paint guy. Just send one of these, or they can come to the top, to the counter and grab one of these. Got it? Okay, confidence test. Everything is pretty simple. It's yes, no on every specific component of the fire escape, including the cantilever and the drop cantilever and the ladders, and also yes, no. I think it's question number 19. It says, are the connections of the anchors into the building sufficient to support the required loads as verified by methods acceptable to the structural engineer? Means verifiable. Open it up. Go into a building and through the sheetrock, put a little hole and bury that little, uh, that little, um, you know, that little wand that uh, you basically photograph. If not from the outside, just drill some holes next to the steel and start doing sampling all over the place to see if there's been any water damage. This is a typical examination. What you're going to want, they were not never providing for you, is when you're speaking with somebody about a fire escape that's three miles away, you don't have to go out there and see it. The engineer is supposed to provide you with some documentation so you can just look at it. Got it? The next thing that we talk about is this came uh, up to us and uh, we shared this with Bob, and this was a document you already have from the state. It's basically, they call it the um, preliminary uh, affidavit. And the, the final, this is a preliminary and a final. What we've done on this, this is construction control document that you already have from the state. All we've done is take it and just change none of the wording from the state and just added the language about the fire escape and turned this into a, a con control document that the state lets you use on any control document. Anything uh, that's over 30, what, 34, 35,000 cubic square feet requires uh, construction control, right? So we just took that document. So does that mean every commercial uh, building that we ever examined that's over 35 automatically needs structural engineer? Is that what you're saying here too? I know we got residential, but all of a sudden as soon as we get over 35,000 cubic square feet and there's a fire escape inspection and or repair, it doesn't need one of these documents. Is that what the code says? You, you must have control. So that was something that we didn't share the last time 
But in our investigation and conversation, we basically said, oh, so that means a preliminary document, and we share this back to you, say, hey, Bob, do you want to include that into your, into your mix? What this means is that uh, during the initial investigation, and it looks like there's repairs that are going to be done on a job, we need somebody to fill out one of these so that it already identifies the vendors, identifies the structural engineer, and that this engineer is in touch with a city official. And they, they're, they're, they're getting a plan together. You know what that plan is? To spot repair that and load test it, or to fully refurbish it to avoid the load test, which is certification. And who's going to decide which way they're going to go? Well, obviously the economics is back to the client. If spot repairing and load testing is 10, full refurbish 15, who chooses that? Not the city. The city will accept either one. It's an economic choice by the owner. But sometimes the load testing on the fire escape and the, and the certification is 15, and the, uh, I'm sorry, the, the spot repair and the load testing is 15, but yet the full refurb is 10. And sometimes a full, a brand new one is 20. Galvanized, 40 year. So who makes that decision? Not the city official. The owner gets those, but the city says, I got two things I'll accept from you. A low test. So you can spot repair any fire escape you want. Okay? And just you know, low testing is not a big thing. I've only the only low test I've ever done is out in California. But right now, just as of yesterday, we're doing uh, we we inspect 375 fire escapes from Harvard. And they want to do one low, they want to low test one of the small fire escapes just to see what the hell this is. <laughs> You know, and sort of look at the economics of it to say, is it worthwhile on some of the buildings that they're not going to hold in the portfolio to not fully refurbish it at this time? Just let's fix it, let's test it, and let's give it, let's buy five years. So there's one coming from Massachusetts, and it's actually on some of the Harvard buildings that we're inspecting. But uh, and there's the and there's the final. So if you read this document, and by the way, we recently found out that this document has been changed recently by the state. It has a new look, but it's the same information. So we haven't. Nothing's changed, it's still a construction control document. All we've done is insert just language about fire escapes. That's all we've done. So if anybody wants to check out and needs to have Bob check out with his legal department, we change, we change no language, we change nothing other than insert that this one is more specific to fire escapes. So if you want to use this on every fire escape, here's another thing that will scare an engineer to doing it right. And say, hey, you're inspecting that building, please provide me with a preliminary affidavit and all your information so we can talk about it. And then I want to know who's going to be paid to oversee. It's called engineer oversight. Three visits, an initial visit to kick off the vendor, a mid-visit to see if he's doing it correctly, a final visit to make sure that it was done correctly, a, a confidence test sign-off, and then what does that vendor do? He calls the city official to do what? Come final inspection. Out of all the people, who's ever done a final inspection on a fire escape? And I don't, I don't mean just Low, some of them have done recently, but I'm talking about anybody has ever done a final inspection on a fire escape three years ago, five years ago? Has anybody ever called you for a final inspection on a fire escape? Because the permit was never pulled. This asks for a permit number. <laughs> this, this, this control document is already giving you everything you need to basically close that loophole that's been uh, abused by the uh, vendors, the landscapers, and the florists. Um, guys, this is here is a uh, repair guidelines. You know how you fix a fire escape? Take out the bolt, separate the connection, wire brush it, prime it, put it back together, and if you're doing the right job, encapsulate it with some silicone. That's the repair guideline for every single piece. So if you read this, every piece is told how to fix it, but it all starts with take the bolt out, clean the connection, prime it, seal it with silicone, put the bolt back in. So that's how simple it is to fix one of these things. Doesn't mention any welding. You can weld on fire skips if you wish. The only problem is it can't have any lead. It has to be fairly new. It has to be a certified welder. And by the way, one year later, you know, for me to meet your requirement, what happens to a welded connection that water and moisture got in there and the guy didn't seal it? Is it suspect? And I need to radiograph it or load test it. How about a bolt? that I put in today, five years from today, do I need to load test that bolt for you? Or can I provide you other evidence of strength that five years ago this was a brand new bolt? So the other evidence of strength on average on a properly maintained fire escape will avoid the load test 15 to 25 years. So as long as you keep that thing painted, keep that thing sealed, I'll be able to provide 
to the city official other evidence of strength. Here's the, here's the certificate. So if you don't want to do it for the, with a new confidence test, here's the Boston certificate. Read right in the middle what it says. To the best of my information, I always believe these egress components are, are in conformity with the provision of the Mass Building Code. It says Section 805, and that's this is an old certificate, but it's now 1001.3. That's all you have to sign. And by the way, two licenses, right? So you have a Boston license. You know what the other license is? Out of California. Massachusetts urges you a building license, a G3. They'll let you sign off on Firescape in Boston and other cities that allow you. In California, in LA, I have a Reg 4 license issued by Fire Prevention. 100 question test, $1,000 fee every three years. You have to not only walk out with a Fire Prevention Marshal, you have to show them how, how you examine, how you uh, write the report. There's all these things that you must do. If not, you can't get your license from Fire Prevention. Those are the only two licenses to look at Fire Escape in the nation. Okay. Let's, uh, I'm going to go one more. This is all the details of how fire escapes are built. Fire escapes have not changed in 100 years. Okay. This here is the drawing of fire escape solutions. So you got all these structural engineers and all these architects out there that are going to give you catwalks over the roof. They're going to give you drawings. So drawing, this is what you expect now when not something on a yellow pad of paper to pull a permit for a new fire escape. You're going to want professional drawings. And this is the tags that, they're, that are in use in, in uh, Seattle. So when you get there, there's a fire escape problem. Okay. The last thing we're going to talk about is we'll go into it at the end. Is what steps can you can you create? And some of them are the simple ones. You got a permit. Sign off on this. Sign off on that. Uh, building the, uh, the fire prevention guys. When you do a smoke detector, what should you be asking for on your list? Here's your smoke detector, sir. Can I have a copy of your fire escape affidavit? They don't have one. Give them this, sir. But now you have a, 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 a check mark on you that says you got to call building department that says I signed this building up but it's incomplete. I mean, I still gave him a cert for the smoke detector so the guy doesn't freak out and start calling everybody. But you basically identified somebody. So depending on your yearly exams, whatever, put it on a list. Building insp uh, housing inspectors, same thing. Your house, you've got houses that have you know people living in the second, third floor, and you basically go in and check for lead, check for this, check for that. What do you want to walk out? And we've done, we've, we've done the housing inspector classes, and they're online. So if you go to the National Firescape Association.org, all these classes, this one's being recorded. The last class we did is online. You can actually go online in case somebody missed this class and watch it online. These two, three, four hour classes are online free. If you go to nationalfirescape.org, not only is the class on there, you just click it and you can watch it on your smartphone, your laptop, or at home, but you can also see the name and phone number of Bob. They, if you want to call him and say, hey, is this any good? Worthwhile, okay. So that's what this book is. This is just basically. Well, I don't know if you thought it, but uh, Rennie Shatnow here is the uh, director, the director of facilities. Yeah. For the local housing authority, they have three thousand units. Uh, yeah. And they have older buildings that have exterior fire escapes. So right. That's why I'm glad he showed up today. And and not just the housing authority, but you know, a lot of people are using Section Eight. So a lot of the private sector is helping on that side, and a lot of people in the private housing sector they have no clue that the fire escape on their building, which nobody ever asked for certificates on, is even a problem. Okay. So again, all the codes concur. We're going to take a short break in a minute now, so that we can also go back there. But the confidence tests, okay, are very important. Here's the one thing that we like that made a difference. This came out of Tacoma. There's a five-year certificate, but Tacoma created the one-year certificate. And the five-year certificate is by a structural engineer. The one-year certificate is by the building manager, by the building owner. And he has three simple questions. Are the bolts and, and, and supports look pretty good? There's no damage, like not, no trucks have hit it? Is the thing painted and looks like it's in good condition? And then all the moving parts on the fire escape working. There's a lot of come down. There's the doors open. There's the windows open onto the fire escape. Sign it. So on some of your one-year inspections, guess what you get from the building department? I mean, from the management company or the owner of the building. Now this is the greatest thing for the fire guys or the building guys when they have something that goes over a roof because they have those goosenecks over the roof. So you tell the man, the manager of the building, say, hey, I like you. I like to see this thing in operation for the one-year certificate. Can you have your maintenance guy go to the roof, climb over, come down? The the, the staircase and activate the cantilever and drop it for you. And as soon as they go, what? 
and there's a problem with the fire escape. Okay? Now, they can hire anybody to do this. So they can hire an engineer to do that process. They can hire uh, a local inspection company to come and perform that for them. But a stuntman. A stuntman. <laughs> well, this is what this does is basically puts a little burden on the ownership to basically, uh, on a one year inspections, make sure that their fire escapes are in good order. But every five years, it's a professional that's going to verify that everything is structural. So a, a lot more people, after they've had their fire escape certified, are going to be able to do this one year. But now, nobody's doing one year. Until you have a five year done and you're certified, you can't perform one year. But as a test on a lot of your commercial buildings, since you have one year inspections for other things, you should have them basically test drive the fire escape system to make sure it's fully functional. Which they're supposed to do anyway, but this forces them to do it. Okay? So what I want to do right now is um, we talked about the tags, and this is what in Lowell, uh, I mean in Seattle, you have to have the white tag, and I think I have a picture here of, of one of the tags in, in play. So this is in Seattle, they want 19 by 11 tags. So there's a, a red one, a yellow one, and it's very clear for a fireman. When he gets there, a fire escape is out of service, so it's color coded. But also when when they pass, they have a white one with all the names on it, including who fixed it, what's their phone numbers, who's the engineer, so a lot of the information is all on the tag. Okay? So let me show you what a typical tag looks like, and we'll, and we'll end it here. But this is a typical tag that has the name of the company, license numbers of who did what, the, the, the residents, you know, one to three families, and how that seems to have a void in there, who can touch it, who can't touch it. So you're really going to have to find out um, because this document that I created for construction control really applies over 35,000 square feet. Can you use it residentially? Of course you can. You, you can say, I'd like you to use as one of your repairs and procedures and guidelines, say, hey, our procedures and guidelines is that if you're touching a fire escape, we'd like you to use this document primarily used for co commercial control, but because it's a fire escape and it's a life safety issue, we want some. We want to identify who the engineer of record is going to be on this, who's going to babysit this thing. So whatever you have to do, so I'm not going to say, yes, you can. I'm going to say, I think you can basically ask the, the the specific case to say, Mr. Engineer of this residence, I'd like you to use these two documents, which we primarily use on, com on commercial application. And this will assure me that this thing is under control. Yeah, I need a legal path. I wish I knew it, but if anybody here knows the legal path, uh, you know, just spit it forward. I'm but, not, I, I understand what you're talking about the program. But I understand, you know, I get resistance. Yeah, I, I would just, you know, speak with uh, Gene, I would speak with the state, I would ask the state what is the thing. You're just basically trying to close up a loophole and believe me, the residential side of things is a huge, huge hole. But, you know, you want engineer oversight anyway, so engineer oversight with or without that document is something you want anyway on all fire escape activity? It depends, yeah. So, so are you going to let the vendors? You said the vendors. You're going to let a vendor pull a permit without any, any, any guidance? Right after the, the fire inspection, it doesn't care. If you, one is the mass code, one is the international building code. So under mass code, the fire escape balcony put the radius that's going to be five meters. Right, every five. So that, that would allow the other engineer, architect, or someone who's just qualified. Right. So that. that's engineer oversight. Correct. So he can either do that on the residence without this document, right. or you can say, what well, we'd like to see, but we'd I like to see that. this this document. I'd like to be in my class and we have it for a record. Uh, you're going to have to ask the state. I, you know, I'm one man with a... I understand. I'm just one for, for, for a legal path. You may want to ask Bob if, what he's, what he, because he checked that out. And uh, again, I think it's going to be a mandatory for commercial activity, but I think it's going to be one of those suggested for residential activity. But you need engineer oversight anyway on residential activity. So it's one, do you let the engineer just kind of wing it? Uh, uh, with you on the residential side of things, or do you say, hey, you know what, just to make it simple, if you could follow the same format as this, I just need you to identify who the vendor is, who the engineer website is, what, how many visits you're going to come, where's your report so I can, you know, have a, a powwow with you on what your course of action, is it spot repair and full, and full uh, uh, and, and a load test, because I want to see that criteria, or is it going to be one of those that you just come down and say, hey, we're refurbishing it all, uh, every boat's being changed, and uh, you're going to actually be the last guy in because he, he goes through three visits to ver verify that all bolts got changed. You're the final one because the vendor's trying to get his permit signed off, and you're going to go there and try to find no old bolts. So let's take a look at, uh, at some of this. You guys can see this thing was buried in the ground this deep. Look, if you look from the side, look over there. You're going to see all the welds that happened when somebody basically, you know, to fix a fire escape, instead of fixing this broken bottom, <coughs> what do they do? They put an angle clip underneath it. 
A lot of no another thing that they do a lot. So the rust is huge in here, right? But then they just weld the nose, and that weld. You know, a lot of people who understand welding, as weld uh, rust grows, it rips a weld. Welds cannot cannot hold anything. If it's got any force, it'll basically just rip. So as it's ripping microscopically, one day it just gives. So weld snap, but bolt stretch. So if I was going to wrong this client. Instead of welding this over here, I should have just changed the bolts and leave the rust in there because at least the bolt will scream for 10 to 15 years. You know, even though I ripped off the client because I didn't want to take all the rust out and it was just a pain. No. The correct way is you got to take everything out 100%. But, you know, don't weld fire escapes. And now the EPA says you can't because if I get caught welding on lead, it's a $35,000 fine anyway. So the fact that the EPA kicked in and is eliminating some of the weld repairs uh, is good. But 98% of all fire escapes are bolted connection. Fire escapes. So now you got to come in here and say, okay, what, what's some of the concerns that you have in regards to some of the welding? A weld five years from now is going to get uh, needs a uh, either X-ray that some people call it an X-ray or a radiograph, or it needs to be load tested. But as soon as I drill a hole through it and I put a bolt in it, and there's no rust evident in the connection, as soon as I put a bolt on any welded connection, that's called a certification. Now there's no need to load test it. There's no lateral load testing for the for the rails. As soon as I change a bolt on any one of these treads that used to have rust, if I just spot repair it, I need to load test that tread. But as soon as I take all the rust out of that tread, re-bolt it, now I'm providing the city with other evidence of strength. There is no load test. So here's what is on the balancing. Every time you inspect a 50, 75, 100 year old fire escape, you're basically saying, I leave behind one old bolt that I, the city wants some assurances. Not guarantees, they want assurances based on the code. And the code says load test it or certify it. Well, load testing is simple. I spot repair it, I load test. Here's the evidence and pass, it didn't fall down. Or I certified it, which is I, even, the bolt, even though the bolt was in good condition, I took that old square head or rivet bolt out, put in a brand new bolt, and now I've reset the clock on that for the next 25 to 50 years. I've sealed it with silicone, and so you got what we call certification, or in all the other codes it's called other evidence of strength. So the authority having jurisdiction shall accept a load test on this thing, but the confidence test makes me not have any rust in any connection. As soon as I've gone through that spot repair process, because the, the confidence test forces me, I have to load test it. But I want to avoid the load test because that three, five, eight, twelve thousand dollars buys no paint, buys no bolts. If you use that to change bolts. So 98% of all the fire escape is going to get changed out, that's called certification. Any welded connection, the weld stays, but to avoid future investigation, radiographing, x-rays, or load testing, as soon as I leave the weld and I put a bolt in it and I seal it all up, I've certified it. So now the weld is there. The connections into the building, it's very simple and we'll show you evidence, is that you've got walls that are either wood or masonry. If they're, if they're masonry, they're buried 8 to 12 inches deep into the, into the building. So I have two options. On that connection, that between the veneer and the, and the, big, and the wall, we could have had water damage for, from the parapet wall for the past 50 years. The only way to do that is to drill a hole next to it and basically investigate and put that little snake down there with a the camera and photograph it because the city wants proof that the thing is embedded correctly. Another option is if I'm going to drill two or three three-quarter holes with a hammer drill into the masonry, can I just go six inches away and drill a new three-quarter hole, one hole, put a healthy epoxy bolt in there under the right conditions, mechanically fasten it back to this connection, fix this connection at the veneer so it's all spalling and cracking, just repack it, make a new connection, put a bolt into it. Now what's the primary? The Hilti. What's the, the other one that's original? Secondary. It's called Letting Sleeping Dogs Lie. Why? Because when you touch it, when it's 75 to 100 year old building and you start touching the wall, what happens? You try to fix one thing and other things are happening, so you basically let sleeping dogs lie, and instead of drilling two, three holes to identify it from the front or, or exposure from the back, if I put in a new epoxy bolt on a masonry building, will you be satisfied that I've given you other evidence of strength? Have I avoided the load test requirement for you? Okay, so that's, that answers that part. What about wood structures? All wood structures, you're not supposed to be lax screwing into a wood structure. What are you supposed to have? Through bolt. So if I go into that wood building 
that residential property and I put a one inch hole in the wall and I, think, I stick my snake in there and I photograph that plate in there, right? Is that, evidence, is that providing you other evidence of strength that I verify that it's not rotted out? Is it a big hole or is it just a one inch hole with today's snake technology? It's a small hole, so I've, I've identified it. But let's say I get outside and I have a problem, can I just put another through bolt into that building? In that residential building? In that wood structure? If all of a sudden they've got all kinds of plumbing and things that basically are blocking my ability to duplicate, can I just put legs on that thing to the ground? As soon as I put legs on the nose of any fire escape to the ground, sitting on saw nose, now, didn't I just create a bridge? The house is a leg. The leg is a leg. Between the two is. So have I eliminated the need for the through bolt? So that's all we do. So all fire escapes, the fix, they were built with bolts, they're going to be fixed with bolts. So you just change every single connection out, and you put bolts in, because the, there's bolts already there. Every hole is already there. How specific are the bolts? That's a great question. Uh, all treads are held with four three-eighths. All clips over here at stand is pretty much half-inch. All uh, gussets are half-inch or five-eighths, depending on, and it's, they just duplicate what's there. Now, everybody says, oh, you got to get me, you know, the grade eight bolt or whatever. What fails the connection? The, the grade of the bolt or the expansion of the connection? So I can put in the, the strongest bolt you give me, but if I let that connection grow, Basically, it's not shearing the bolt, it's always expanding the bolt and ripping it this way. So, to prove that, I can take a connection on a tread, take out the bolts, and wedge in a piece of wood in there, a good strong piece of wood, and have you step on it, she's not going to shear. So, what's the real problem there? Is it, is it the grade of the bolt that can't handle uh, the, the, the connection failure, or the fact that the, the connection is failing? So all these connections during this refurb is going to get silicone sealed with 50-year silicone. So you open up the connection, you wire brush both sides, and you put in, uh, you, you primer it, and before you put it together, you inject it with 50-year silicone, and then you run your finger all around it. That's the silicone. We've had some failures in certain silicones that right now we're also investigating the rubber gasket. You know the last piece of rubber you put on a rubber roof, that, uh, that one that has the, the glue on one side? We're now uh, working with that to see if those Prior to putting a tread back together, can we put that on one side of the tread and instead of having a, uh, a silicone gasket, have a rubber gasket? And that way it can extend the warranty. But when you silicone a connection, you can at least give the client at least a 10 year warranty. We feel that when you do the rubber gaskets, you're going to be able to bring it up to 25 on certain components on the fire escape. The one thing you don't guarantee paint, you don't guarantee cement. Why? Because they're constantly changing. But can you guarantee everything on the fire escape outside the fire escape? and you're managing this just the connections? Yes. What's left for the client? Paint. Will this, will this start spot pitting and spot rusting within one to three years? Yes. Should they have a, a maintenance program that includes spot painting over the next three to five years? Full painting in the next five to seven or 10 years? Yes. In Chicago, you gotta paint your fire escape fully every three years. Do they? No. But there's all these laws that were forcing the maintenance, but just nobody ever was enforcing. So what was your question? What do you do with the base? Uh, where it's right into the... Yeah. How do you verify that? Or do you not? No, you have to. How? I, well, no... Well, you said that was buried, so... Yeah, it was buried. They, they basically, it was sitting in asphalt that was up here. Right. So, as soon as we get to a job and we see it not sitting on a slab, <laughs> and okay. it's into the dirt, this is what we expect to see. Right. So we basically either dig that out and, and basically create a slab. I've seen uh, situations where we've actually got granite slabs and basically bury the granite slab in the ground and have the fire escape land on the granite slab. So, we, knowing that it's in the dirt, I mean, we get to such, certain situations where they've landscaped so much, they've got 12 inches worth of landscaping, and the legs are buried deep, and they're all rotting out because they're constantly wet. Okay? Any other questions on this? This is, a, this is basically to show you when you look in and you look down how much rust is growing on every connection. And, and I'll, I'll mention one last piece. See these through bolts? what's called the spacers. These spacers are basically on the gratings and all the trays of old 50 to 75 year old fire escape. You can't get in there, you can't clean these out anymore, you can't pull this rod out and clean it. This is what new grating looks like. The new grating is basically, this is a welded rod on top that is not having a spacer. But every fire escape that you're gonna get, there's gonna be a disclaimer always for the treads and for the grating, and that the only thing you can do on, the, on those, because they're irreparable, is create a sandwich to hold them temporarily. They should be replaced because as these separate and open, 
your foot gets stuck in. The only thing you can do is weld them back to the clip, but they're full of lead. So you only can replace them, or if you create a sandwich by putting a flat bar on top, a flat bar underneath, and then you run you know, bolts, carriage bolts. Again, you want to talk about 3 16ths of, of uh, so it's not a trip hazard, you know what I'm saying? But it's the only thing you can do to basically get some more life out of grading and treads. It's a pain. The amount of money you're spending keeping some lead and, 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 and no guaranteed treads and, and grading, a lot of now is flipping over to new grading, galvanized. Galvanized treads, galvanized grading, silicone shut all the connections. All the welded connections must be bolted to avoid blow testing. And so that's what you get here. You get one of these that, can we do it wrong? You sure. Just look underneath and see all the wrong ways to fix this fire escape. Can you do it right? Right is basically a, a, a rectus set. Just take all the bolts out and put in new bolts. Would, right. the, would, would the bolts typically be galvanized as well? No, again, it's another, you know, if the fire escape is galvanized, put galvanized bolts. But you just need to basically, it's, it's, it's connection maintenance, you know, basically just stuck. Keep maintaining your fire escape. The owners keep painting them, but the connections which have been primed, sealed with silicone, Basically, if the water can't get back in there, that's what's going to give it another 25 to 50 years. I think we're concerned about the non-anchor connections and dissimilar rails. Um, no, it's, it's, I think you're talking about if I have an aluminum fire escape? Yeah, or, or any material where the metals are dissimilar enough for a, uh, an accelerated deterioration. Kind of yeah, uh, all fire escapes are just plain steel. There are very few. As a matter of fact, we got only one case in here. I think I talk, spoke with Sean about it. we got an aluminum fire escape. So we'll cover that aluminum fire escape question, and that is, um, Every now and then you're going to get a fire escape that shows up that has aluminum or it's a wood fire escape and, we're, and we run the question as how do we load test a fire escape that's wood that's already 25 years old, pressure treated only last, you know, on average 30 years and can we or not load test that fire escape or do we basically try to band-aid it enough so we can get one last five year cycle out of it but basically telling the client, listen, the city is basically giving you a five year reprieve to basically get it out of here and replace it. But the aluminum fire escape is a question in that there was a lot of fire escape built over the past 20 to 30 years by a guy out of the south who used to have an aluminum siding business and he would also part time and build you some aluminum fire escape but they would come out and not have a permit on them. Some of the standards of the, of the 100 pounds per square foot low test was not, was not met and a lot of them would lag screwed into the building. So any other questions on this and we'll get back yeah, to so it. Basically there's two methods. When you need an engineer for the three phases to oversee it, yeah. either you do a complete renovation, which would be all bolting, you don't need a load test. Correct. If you do a spot repair, then you need a load test. You need a load test. So then you just go by pricing. And then it's just the client picks the pricing that best fits in. You can also just replace it at this time. Say, hey, why don't you put a brand new galvanized fire escape for the same thing? Because every now and then the number is not that far off. Sometimes the repair cost is 75% of the replacement cost. And some people use that as a my if you're if I'm already at 75. What's the advantage that I get if I go if I go the, the full refurb? Well, let's talk about certification versus load testing. As soon as I load test it this year, five years from now I'm going to load test it again. So there's another five, ten grand coming for this load test. The fire escape could still be could pass now five years from now because we did a great job of spot repairing it. But five years from now, three, five, eight thousand dollars for load test. They certified it today. They just went, you know what? Let's spend the extra five grand. Let's just totally recertify the whole thing. Give it a paint job and silicone shut all the connection. Five years from now. No load test. Because I'm going to be providing other evidence of strength. Ten years from now, what are you providing? Other evidence of strength. Fifteen years from now. So on average, if you keep maintaining it and you have a good policy with your fire escapes now under the paint roll, you can have 15 to 25 years that you're going to be basically using the other evidence of strength. Hit the 25-year mark, now what are you going to get? You may want to, because now you're in that 25 to 50-year life cycle again. Do you want to change all the bolts out again? It's really a call with the city directors. You had mentioned before that the requirements for construction of a stair exterior egress system is not dissimilar to what Chapter 10 requires for, for, for egress stairs. Uh, I can't tell you how many fire escapes or egress systems I've seen that are super skinny don't be 36 inches wide, don't have a nine inch tread and all the rest of it. So how can we take an existing non-conforming stairway and say, okay, it's kosher and, you know, and still be? Good question. Let's just uh, clarify that and then and then we'll start the show again. But you're basically saying, is this a fire escape or does this mean to be rest? If it's a fire escape, the minimum requirement, guys, is 22. Rise and run is eight and eight, right? And that's, that's a fire escape. 
So what that means is usually a third means of regress. It's not your second means of regress. It's almost like, hey, I have an addict, and I'm, and I'm putting in a, uh, a third means of egress. So I, I, I'm using a fire escape. I'm going to classify a fire escape. So fire escape is 22. Second means of egress. No, this is an apartment. I want that window to become a door. I want 7-Eleven, 36 inches wide. I may want a cover. I may want a kick plate, even though it's a... So you're looking at an exterior <coughs> stair. You're not calling it. So thousands of fire escape, uh, thousands of exterior stairs got built under the fire escape code to satisfy the egress code. Now you have a pre-existing condition. When I go to examine a fire escape, I'm just certifying this system, not whether or not it's conforming, was built correctly, you know, and a lot of that is just research back into the jacket of the building. Did somebody even put it up legally or not? You know, so you have the right, if there was never a permit pulled on it, to basically ask for one of two things. Have the fire escape reverse engineered so that there is a set of plans that you can put in the, in the, in the jacket, or accept it, you know, have the building commission accept it as a, a pre-existing condition, non-conforming, like every other building in garage in the backyard up against the neighbor's yard, six inches over the property line, whatever, you know, this. Um, so it's really, uh, you know, the new ones getting built should be built. You have to say, is this a fire escape or, or a second means of egress? If it's a second means of egress, you're looking at the exterior stair code. So that, that'll help you. So fire escapes, but the norm is that everybody's walking in and slapping up a fire escape 22 inches. The norm here is 24, but the minimum is 22. So that's where that, that abuse was, was happening for many years. Okay? First, we'll continue with the uh, building code. Exterior, uh, exterior stairs, when you're building exterior stairs. Well, while we're at it, let's talk about, uh, you know, exterior stairs. How many, how many fire, how many decks in the back of a building are built as your second means of egress? So they have this nice deck off the back window. Uh, it's just, it's clearly your second means out. And then you're going down these set of stairs. And what's the, uh, what's the thing for the wood? Five quarter. What's it supposed to be? Inch and a half. So whenever anything, uh, just, can you build a fire escape of uh, anything other than wood, I mean other than metal. You may make it out of wood, but you must meet the fire rating. And in order to meet the fire rating, will five quarter do it, or does it need an inch and a half? Inch and a half. And a lot of decks are built to what, 60 pounds a foot or, or 50? So if you're going to use your deck as a fire escape egress, what do you got to do? What do you got to what, what be built to? 100 pounds a square foot. How many pre-existing ones are out there that basically now it's a catch-22? So some cities basically make you double up the deck. The five quarters just double up. There's your inch and a half. Stiffen up and put some more um, beef on the, on, the, on the stair. I mean, there's many things they have, they have to do. But the, the rule of thumb is what do you build on the building? If it's wood, can I put a wood, a wood fire escape on it? If I have a wood building, can I put a wood fire escape on it? Yep. If it's a brick building or a metal building, can I put a wood fire escape on it? Must meet the building type. So when you're constructing a fire escape, you must you can match the building type. Traditionally, all fire escapes are built out of metal because they last the longest. You can ignore them the longest. Pressure treated fire escapes. What happens to them after 15 to 25 years? The water got into all the joints. Did what to the bolts, into the nails, into the screws? Ate them, and then they want us to do what? Load test or certify? So wood structures on a case by case basis is a is a is a problem. Because a lot of times, all, all we do when it comes to a wood and working with the city official, we say, the best thing to do here is get the metal plates and basically reinforce all the joints, seal up all the joints, and usually you give the client either a five or 10 year rule that says, hey, very soon, your fire escape is so old, you've got no time left. And we can't load test it, so it's really a, a, a play with the building official to say, you know, just how, uh, can we load test this? I, I wouldn't guarantee the load test on a wood structure. You know what I'm saying? So, but you can reinforce it to the best of your ability using metal. Because a lot of times, two to three inches from the end of every piece of wood, it's already rotted because the water got in that way and ate. So the rest of the wood is nice and pressure treated still. A lot of people don't realize that pressure treating is not the entire piece of wood in, through, through the interior. It's just an outside. And as soon as you cut it on either, either end, that's where it basically, and nobody treats it. You're supposed to use that green chemical where you're supposed to use a suit. <laughs> nobody ever does that. But they leave all these joints open on these beautiful fire escapes, uh, wood fire escapes, and they stop rotting immediately for the first two to three inches. And you, no matter how many nails you put back in that joint, it can't. So you have to use metal to basically span six to eight inches away from everything 
and then start screwing. So that's what we're, whenever we hit a wood deck, we basically say metal's coming. We basically buy five, at the most, ten years. What about all these wooden porches in the back of the building? Horror stories. Case, yeah, collapse kills 27 people. Fire towers. Uh, some of you may recognize this. We have somebody here from Waltham or Watertown? Yeah. Is this Waltham or Watertown? Waltham. This is Waltham. I inspected this thing uh, four or five years ago. They were using it for training. And that day, I basically went my hammer testing. This is interior. We, we recently got a call back from the fire chief looking at it to say, hey, we want to look at this again. I said, okay, somebody had fixed it and they started reusing it. We did Brookline fire tower. Guess what happened to theirs? Same issues. The great thing that I got on the, on the, on the fire tower in, uh, in Brookline though is they had a, a dummy that they used for training. And I haven't incorporated this in yet, but I, I basically took their 150 pound dummy and I started throwing them down the fire escapes. So in some of our future classes, I actually got to go holding up a dummy and say, hey, tread falls. You know, we just throw a guy down the stairs and we show them just what happens. We also show a case of rail failure, what a 10 foot drop would do. So we basically drop the dummy, you know. Um, so either on the interior or the exterior, we're just basically going to show uh, in the future just, just the, you know, what a fire escape does to you with metal. Metal is very unforgiving, you know. It'll break bones and, and basically, but um, this is the kind of rust that we found. This is up in Chelsea, old folks home. Up on the hill? It took them two years before the state finally gave the money that it took to, to basically uh, fix the fire escapes. Two years later. So if the war didn't get you, the fire escape will. And this is what also happens to fire escapes. They get damaged. Here's a great question. If you get a fire escape that gets knocked up by a trash truck or a moving truck, and they just damage the lower stair, what part of that do I fix? Just the stair. Well, the whole fire escape now must be brought back into, uh, into certification. So every now and then we tell a client that just calls us up screaming that a, a tr trash truck or a or moving truck smashed their fire escape, their eight-story fire escape or their five-story. So we call that a fire escape lottery ticket. We say, listen, just so you know, all the abuse you didn't didn't get fixed, all the things you didn't do. Now this truck now has to fix all that abuse. Their insurance. Their insurance. And if it's a hit and run, the homeowner's insurance or the building's insurance will fix the whole thing because I can't just fix the, the lower part. I have to fix the whole thing. An engineer must certify the whole thing and bring it back into operation. Because you put a tweak the whole thing? The whole thing must be repaired and painted. So a lot of times instead of $5,000 repair, it's a $25,000 re rehab on the job simply because um, the code requires that the whole entire system be brought up into the code. <clears throat> uh, this is funny. I think this is uh, Haverhill uh, City Hall. Has anybody see the missing trades? <laughs> this is typical housing. You know, when we go and ping the, ping the hammers in, in Boston, you know, we were pinging the, uh, the treads and they all started falling. Some of these things we find as we get there, this is already there when we get there. How nobody saw this during their alley walks or whatever. Have you seen the missing treads? That's on the city hall. City hall. Yeah. In that here. This is the piece. Welding. Can't do it anymore. Can't weld on anything that has light. Well, they remediate it first, can they weld? It's not worth it. By the time you basically take all the lead off of the fire escape. And here's the catch 22. This happened to me in, in Harvard. We had a, a 10 story structure that needed a repair. Prior to doing the emergency repair, we needed to remediate the area so that we could do some repair to it because it had lead. The lead guys couldn't get on it because the fire escape was dangerous to let us fix it so people could get on it. <laughs> we gave a catch 22. So what they did, they had to build a, 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 a scaffolding tower and basically shut down the, and build a brand new fire escape system. And it turned into a half a million dollar situation. Because it was on the back of a, you know, commercial uh, resolution. So you can see from below, the welds, the difficulties, leave the existing hardware on it, just weld the nose, or weld some, you know, weld some rods. And again, they never pull a fire permit. When's the last time anybody see a fire permit being pulled to do a fire escape repair? 
you get called there, usually when they set the, the building on fire, or they sell, they set the grass down below on fire or do something. And usually by the time you get there, the guys, you know, they've hidden the welding machine, and they've got their paint buckets out to say, oh, what are you doing? Uh, we were painting, and somehow the grass got on fire. Well, my you, was you won't bless that without a load test. Now, right? I know, but there's no welding anymore anyway. And if there's a properly welded connection, to avoid the low test, as soon as you blow a bolt through it on a properly welded connection that has no rust inside, as soon as you put a bolt into it, there's no need to talk about the, uh, the, uh, the weld. They don't care. The bolt is the primary now. So this is, uh, so this is us when we put the piece together, we cut it and created a model piece to bring it here for you. And this is the old one. This is the new one going off to the side. So, use every day. Kids come out here for recess every day. Kindergarten to eighth grade. So, as you can see, fire escapes are out there, ready to grab people. Uh, what we're trying to make you do is not have you walk up and down these things. From the ground, you can see now evidence of rust. You can see evidence of non maintenance. And the main thing that we want to remind you, whether you're a building inspector or a firefighter, is that you, know, you don't. Um, I'll show you that in a second. Let me just go back one. This over here, the um, the one thing we don't have firemen doing when they walk up and down in the middle of the night on a fire escape, we don't have them walking around with a little ping hammer to help to identify whether a fire escape is going up is good or not. This is a reminder. I thought quickly you can lose the fire. Okay. Now I've got a chance to look at all kinds of fire escape nationwide, so we inspect all over the nation. This is in Rutgers University. I think this is a frat house. And believe it or not, that's a fire escape. This is service these two windows. That's another interesting because they were vendor driven. There's, there's many different styles, designs, attachments. It's amazing. This, this, this is just an odd duck that I've never seen this in my life. It's about to have one, not to have two. Imagine some drunk fraternity guy basically trying to get away from whatever and he can you know, you know hang on hang on to the pole. So firemen, you know, the kind of training they need just to hang on to the pole and slide correctly. But Matt, and this is at Rutgers University. This is a Rutgers building. Have you seen emergency slides, ever slides? Uh, I'll show you one right now. Um, guys you remember the uh, the the point here that we're trying to say is that on a lot of these buildings, the key is that's an eight year old child right there. This is the Bridgeport fire. But look how many fire escapes. Look how that fire is raging. And when they got there, this was a rescue mission, not a firefight. So they had to let that go until they got everybody down. Those 5, 10, 15 minutes of time it took to get all the people off the building, then they could start fighting the fire. That's a lot of waste. How many people here have trained their 8-year-old daughter to you know, go down a ladder and jump? So it's not even go down the ladder and hit the ground. Go down the ladder, which is not working, and jump 10 to 12 feet. And imagine the ladder let go while she's on it. But right now, firefighters are taking out the ladders and rolling up the hoses. But earlier in the night, when they pulled up, there were flames coming out of the side of the building. Firefighters say it was one of the scarier moments because when you pull up to a building and you see children and mothers hanging off the side of the fire escape, smoke swirling around them. They said, that's scary, scary stuff. They got up there, they got the ladders up, and they said nobody got hurt. The uh, fire escape, there was uh, three or four people hanging off the fire escape. They couldn't get off. They were just on the fire escape. I had people hanging in the fire escapes at the rear of the building, and on this side of the building, they, we had a bunch of people on that fire escape. Well, about 50 people were displaced inside yes. this building. I'm our fire fire There's good news tonight. It looks like everybody will be allowed to go back in, except the one unit where the fire was in. They said, that's good luck to them tonight. I'm almost on the Cedar Bridgeport, using. It's not quick. You know, these things can go from, you know, and this happened in, in uh, Marble Street, fourth floor. She got out of the fire. She saved herself. She got out of the fire escape. The fireman got up there. And basically, he, here comes the ladder. You're safe now. Don't worry about it. You know what I'm saying? And he's reaching for the ladder. In the last split second, it all goes away, and what happened to her? She fell. <coughs> he saved himself, and the, the, the woman died, but the daughter, um, I mean, the niece survived. 
This is some buildings when we do the exposure. It looks beautiful out here, doesn't it? But between the veneer and the actual base where you block wall, what's happening in there? Okay. Water. 50 years of ping, ping, move water. Coming in between that little three quarter gap, that half inch gap between the veneer and the machine rock wall, it rotted all the steel. What happens when you load test things like this? They fail. So this is a this is one of those situations where instead of spending 500 bucks to open up a wall and tell me what's wrong with it, if I put a new epoxy bolt six inches away from a main connector, do I care what this looks like inside? If I got a new connection, sure. let sleeping dogs lie. What, what are all the problems they have? As soon as they started exposing this, the, the, the other things came up that were inside the building. It's a can of worms. And all I have to do is, six inches away, put a new epoxy bolt there. Anchor it. If you have a question that, you know, a row of ten connectors uh, individualized, you can basically seat a, a two by two or three by three angle underneath it, run it the full length. Every two feet you have an epoxy anchor, and then you basically connect all the support back to this one piece of angle. You've just unified, you've unified all the connections now. So in order for that thing to fall, you have to rip the whole wall down. So you can unify all your connections that way too. Single it, you need to do a single repair or unification of the connections. Nothing left. And this was actually on the 20 story building in Chicago that the structural engineer passed originally. Another structural engineer said, no, we need to do some spot inspection of the wall because they were going to turn this into uh, housing. Uh, senior housing. And during this investigation, that's when they found it. <coughs> this is another one we did down in New Jersey. Water had been getting into the, from the roof coming down. Look at all that. All right away. So we can go and dig these out. And it's a big can of worms. Or just create a new epoxy connection next to it. Or throw a piece of angle and marry all of them with a bolt. And so every two feet, you have an epoxy. Or a through bolt. So don't think epoxy is always the end. Because everybody's like questioning epoxies now. You can actually run another clip and put a through bolt somewhere inside the building. When, you know, as long as you don't know, have something that's ornate that stops me from getting. But if it's just a sheetrock wall, open up a hole 12 inches wide, get in there, put in a plate, put a through bolt, and avoid the epoxies if you not if you have questions about the epoxy. Okay. This is the other thing you can do: drill holes. So take that three wide hammer drill, and do that, and then send your uh, your snake down there. But when you send your snake down there, what do you get to see? You get to see a lot, or is it kind of questionable what you're going to be able to see? So if it takes two three-quarter or three three-quarter holes for me to get some visual advantage to throw my little snake down there, why not I just take that thing and put a hole over there about you know six inches away, put a epoxy bolt there, and then mechanically put a clip back to the to the main support. So keep my original, give me a, give you a new one, and now I'm I'm at. 150, 200 percent of what's required by, by law. Because my primary now is brand new. And let sleeping dogs lie. They look very similar. This look pretty good. But because I had to verify prior to the low test, right? So we, we highly recommend that you duplicate connections into the building. This is what the interior looks like. You're looking from the inside out. So these are the kind of things you're going to be seeing with that little snake. Is it damaged or it's going to be in pristine condition? See, it's not always the greatest advantage or vantage point from where you're at, but okay, this is all the verification process. This is load testing. Load testing can be done with sandbags, load testing can be done with water bags, load testing can be done with a cabling system where you basically raise a weight from the ground. And on this one in California, we chose to use a 10,000 pound truck underneath ran the cabling up through the floor, and because of floors that had uh, a piece of angle going across, the engineer determined that by pulling on that middle of that angle, you basically were creating a load of 3,000 pounds. So we low tested 10 stories that way. So the engineer has to provide to the city official a criteria of what the load test is going to be. Is it going to be sand? Is it going to be water? Or is it going to be cabling? Okay, that's what the engineer oversight is all about. And then you basically start Now, raising the back of a truck, or you can have a big 
you know, big uh, pile of uh, bricks on the bottom. Is that guy standing underneath the fire escape? <laughs> no, no, this is up. The, those are all the fire escapes above. So no, I know, but the guy that's on the chain falls. Right, right but the fire escape is he's doing is the uh, not the tenth floor. So you got seven fire escapes between them. But otherwise, when they get close to this, you have to pull it away and you have to put a, a scaffolding underneath. That's what we did. And this is us reading the reading the the piece right there. Of course, we did a certain type. Here's another fire escape that we inspect that's missing pieces. So some of these old ones don't even have a protective rail. Some of these don't even have enough for your foot. In some old fire escapes, they only have a 12-inch platform for the firemen. This is, this is, these are the 75-year-old or, or greater fire escapes and that. Even the platform can't put a rail because now you can't even get yourself. If there was a rail there, you couldn't even get it. But it's a fall hazard. This is the fire escape that we were involved in in the case of firemen fell. From that floor fell through, landed down here, went back up and saved a woman and a child. But when he was done with, with, the, with the rescue, he basically shattered his vertebrae. The uniqueness of this case is that this wasn't just a claim for uh, workers' comp and uh, disability. He sued the owner directly for negligence. When we went back to investigate this two years later, the only thing that was fixed on the fire escape was the three treads that fell through. The rest of the fire escape was still falling apart. So it was during this investigation that we got to lead it to work up with a metallurgist who basically gave us a lot of the insights that we share with you today. To grow a quarter inch of rust, you need to let it go for 25 years. To, that, to get a half inch of rust on any connection, you need 50 years of unchecked growth. So from that, we basically came in and we now can explain to you, this is us going up the fire escape. And as we're going up, trips are falling. This is a fire escape that had firemen on it now, lawyers, owners, Defendants, and we're all out walking up and down this fire escape, and all the pieces and this thing just falling apart as we walk. So they settled this case quickly after this because we proved that two years ago or three years ago, when the farmer got hurt, the guy did nothing but fix the three treads. Yet there was 50 years of neglect on the fire escape still, so he had it repaired by a vendor. And what did that vendor fix? Those three treads. What about the, the other treads that were ready to go? Well, he wasn't asked to fix those. So let's talk about, and we'll go slowly now with, with just what, how fire escapes and how rust grows, so you can understand what you have out there. All fire escapes in the United States, when they were built in the 1900s and sooner, so some fire escapes in Washington uh, were built, and New York and Boston were built in the 1850s. So the older the building, you're going to start seeing fire escapes was a means of egress. At, at those times, but usually on people that have a few bucks because otherwise everything was a single staircase up the side of a, you know, row houses. It was only after several fires killed many, many people that people said, you know what, we need an answer. So they started putting connecting balconies on the back of these row houses that basically connected you to your neighbor and you crossed the firewall. So fire, that's the reason for fire escapes. Around the 1930s and 1940s, the, uh, uh, the building code changed and said, you know what, we're not going to allow fire escapes anymore. We're going to we want all fire escapes, I mean all staircases to be two in on the interior and on the exterior basically we just want to maintain these fire escapes until they, they're, they've disappeared. So everybody expected by this time that fire escapes were all going to be gone. Nobody expected anybody to you know, find duct tape, paper clips and bubble gum is what everybody's been using to hold these things together. So they expected all these buildings to be down on the ground by now and these fire escapes were going to go away. So maintenance was the only thing. They just kept this, just keep it painted. But now a lot of these fire escapes are 50, 75, 100 years old and still here. And they look like that. So now what we're faced with is something that should have been replaced or removed or should not be there anymore because a new building went up in its place and firemen still have to use it, tenants still have to use it. And nobody had a, nobody had a plan, nobody expected them to be here. So when you have a piece of fire escape, you buy a 20 foot piece of steel. You cut it into little pieces and you make treads, you make rails, you make supports. When I take two pieces of steel and I put them together, do I prime and paint it before I put them together? No. When I when I bolt it or weld it or or uh, or rivet it, right, and I join the two together, do I prime or paint it prior to the assembly? So I take this tread that I've assembled out of several out of these twenty foot pieces, and has anybody who's ever sweated a piece of pipe to basically solder it? What happens when you put uh, you know, fire on a, on a piece of metal. What's it start doing? Expand. Well, expand, but it also starts sweating. It, almost, it looks like it's uh, drying, you know, like it looks like the, the metal was wet. 
And when you heat a copper, you start seeing it drying for some reason, you know, that whole wet, dry look that basically metal already has moisture in it. So I got two pieces of metal that I put together, I bolted it, riveted it, or welded it, and then I paint this, this little tread. Where's the first failure going to happen on this tread or on this rail or on this support? And the connection with is, is there any primer in there between the two? Now the only thing keeping it from rusting is what's called air. Because I need air and water. I already got the moisture in the metal itself. What's it need in order to grow? Air. But some guys sealed it with paint. So as long as you keep it sealed, what doesn't get in there? The air that needs for it to rust, right? But like all metal that is bolted, in the summer it heats and does what? In the winter it cools and does what? As soon as you do that with stiff paint, what's it do to the seam of the paint? Cracks. So that's where water gets in. So in the first five years or, or so of a, of a piece of metal's life, you get surface rust. What you're supposed to do diligently is every one to three years get in there, wire brush it, and apply a new, a new sealant to basically stop air from getting back in there. Do people do that? What happens on in the next you know, 10 to 25 years, because you never cleaned it, never painted it, water got in and did what to, to the joint, which is over there. Got the, got, it penetrated from the top of the clip to the bottom of the clip. And did what? Rust. I got a 16th, I got an 8th, I got something. I got a ribbon. Does it eat the ribbon yet? Or is it just surround the ribbon and start eating it? Surround it. But then now the ribbon, the bolt, whatever, it, as this grows from a 16th to an 8th to a quarter, what happens to that ribbon or that bolt? Does somebody go in there and loosen the, the nut a little bit to give it some breathing room? So as it starts stressing it and pushing it apart, it basically takes like spaghetti, it takes something just to start folding it apart. So you basically compromise. And as that grows, and I'm using a tread as an example, as you start pushing it, especially on all the fire skin with rivets, they only have very little shaft. As soon as you as soon as you push that away, that's why on a fire skin, as you're going up and you step on it, even though it's got rust in there, it's hitting the shaft. But as soon as you keep pushing that angle outbound, what happens? Eventually you run out of shaft and what happens? You have nothing but rust and your foot pressure to do what? Break and pass through and that's when firemen are going up in the middle of the night. So basically once you've got about a quarter inch, depending whether you have a rivet or a bolt, the, the nut is either eaten, the shaft is either eaten, or you basically push it away from the rivet so that now there's nothing holding it. There's no stoppage and that's what happens. So as we were walking up the fire escape, we had all this kind of rust in the whole, you know, that a fireman two years ago, you know, basically fell through this thing, and as we're going up, just from our natural walking, what was happening? So they settled the case pretty quickly on that. Now I'm going to talk about how firescapes are built and put together. So we talked about masonry building, we talked about wood structures. That's it. There's, there's nothing else that is, that is out there that we're attaching to. So. Believe it or not, a piece of steel is only 8 to 12 inches buried into the wall. So you got your veneer, which is not structural, and then you've got the wall that somebody created a pocket, put in a T-bar or an angle or a C-channel in there and just pack it. You know, just put cement around it. Do you think they'd even put a stopper in the back or some sort of bar in the back? Nope, it's not. As soon as it's small, it'll pull right up. So that's the standard connection that you see, whether it be a railing sticking in, or whether it be a, it's basically through the veneer. As water gets in here on all your sills, what does it do to that support? Rust jacking, ice jacking. As rust grows five times, a quarter inch will grow to one inch as it expands. What's it do to the bricks above it, the bricks beside it, the bricks below it? What's it do to the sills? It does exactly this. As it pushes up, it snaps all your sills, creating more Pockets for what for water to get in there. Do what? Start ice jacking and rust jacking in here. Open these up, and the water keeps feeding its entire life. And as that grows, you're basically just spalling the whole wall. Here we have two staircases on one C channel <coughs> in the wall, and no brace. See, no brace here. Only two staircases, and that's only eight to twelve inches deep. So as soon as you load that with tennis and firemen, what's going to happen to that piece? So a lot of them have the bracket, and 
and sometimes the bracket is embedded into the building, so the water channels into here and does what? Okay. So you have to have answers for these. Do you want to continue going back into the building, or do you want to basically put an angle on the side and basically have an expansion bolt and basically cut this away from the wall and then repack the wall so that there's no more water going back into the building? And what's holding the bottom is just an expansion bolt to help basically save the envelope of the building. So these are suggestions to, to change some old practices. This is a through bolt on the inside. Sometimes there's so much pressure that it basically starts pulling the, bolt, the, the bricks on the inside. A lot of this is some of your factories. You're going to see a lot of these through bolts that look like this. And a lot of them is not a plate, it's a donut. And, it's, and as the brick deteriorates, they stop pulling. And outside, you start seeing a lean on the, uh, on the platform. Recently, uh, and again, Massachusetts, because of the medical marijuana, in case you want to start growing uh, mar you know, medical marijuana, and then you want a nice wet place, fire escapes are great for you to start growing ferns and bushes and stuff. But this is an indication when you got this much green on a the wall, there's a lot of water coming down. Broken drain pipes, a uh, platform that's pitched backwards, some of your theaters, this is a theater, a lot of them have diamond plate or, or cement pads that basically fill with water and they rot out the whole structure and, you know, hear this. This is an interior of a parking garage. You know, you know how many parking garages you guys have that have an exposed stairway that's closed but the windows are open and the rain and the snow gets in there? And all of the steel pan sta stairs? All exterior steel wood stairs. This is a this is a Boston Library. One inch of rust on a Boston Library. That guy said is doing nothing. Again, if you want to grow plants. <laughs> Nobody's ever going to go check your fire escape to see if you're illegally growing any plants, are they? Just in case you. And then you got lakes in the ground. So it always ends up solid too. The lay is a lay. The building is a lay. You got a bridge in between. So that's sometimes a solution whenever you can't fix the connection into the building. Uh, basically, you put a lake to the ground and you re uh, reattach. So this is attached into the building, not necessarily all the way through because see the connection here? But it has a lake. Got The barbed wire is extra. Sometimes you get smashed, you know, fire escape gets smashed by a truck. This is all veneer damage. And a lot of times they don't go beyond this, they'll just stay right here and they'll patch this and